stand in our Bibles and open up uh, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and you guys, we're going to definitely, we're going to finish down to verse 21, uh, no matter what. This is part three. This is part three of this message uh, titled, Wanted, Dead, and Alive. The amazing, I was going to say bizarre, it's impossible to understand in the flesh, in our own human understanding, that the Christian life is a life of being dead and then coming to the knowledge of Christ, which makes us alive. And then what does God do? The moment we come to the knowledge of him, he says to us, you need to be dead again. You were once dead to me when you lived in the world for yourself, but now that you've come to me, you're alive. And we all go, yes, Jesus, I'm alive. And he said that, I have come to give you life and that more abundantly. Jesus said that if a man who believes in me dies, yet he lives, which is a very cool statement because as we just prayed for Ed, that the moment you or I or Ed stop physically functioning in this world, the moment you close your eyes for the final time physically here, your eyes open up in the presence of God instantly in heaven. And so the Bible says that when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so the scripture says that when we live like that, when we live a life in the spirit, we are actually dead to ourselves now and alive unto God. And you guys have been theologians here in the book of Romans, especially chapters four and five. And today uh, we'll put an end to this third point of this argument, but it's very, very powerful. So here's what we're going to do, because we've been here so long, we're going to read Romans chapter 5, verses uh, 12 to 21, but uh, you're going to close your eyes and just recite it from memory. (laughs) Just kidding. I'll start out in verse 12 if you'd pick it up. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, of course, speaking of Adam, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Remarkable statement right here. Who is a type of him. Adam is a type of Jesus who was to come. Amazing. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, speaking of Christ, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. I'd like to insert a hallelujah to that one. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered, think of the commandments of God, the law of the Old Testament, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Lord Jesus, speak to us, we pray today by the power of the Holy Spirit to honor the Father. And to honor the Father is to know the Son, in whom we read this morning the benefits of all that Jesus has provided to us. We ask in Jesus' name, and again, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. And so this we know, we know that wanted, dead, and alive, 
we learned that we are pronounced dead upon arrival in verses 12 to 14. And that's what we had been studying, looking at that, at this strange, wonderful paradox or contradiction of the Christian life, as I mentioned a moment ago, that when he says there, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, so this Adam brought to us sin into this world, and as a result, death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. We talked last time, because all being sinners, the Bible says we've all sinned, that the result of all of that is the witness of death itself. And then secondly, we saw in verses 15 to 16, this is where we actually uh, left off, was in this argument, that one is dead and alive means that, that there's a definition and that's uh, defined by one man's offering. And I want you to think about this one man. You got to pick a man right now. You got to pick one. You got to pick Adam or you got to pick Jesus. And it's amazing. Uh, and we'll see more of it today how the Bible here is announcing to us that just as Adam was a prototype of mankind, so Jesus Christ is the last Adam that is a prototype of what man should be like. And it's a quite a remarkable thing, because Adam, remember, started out in a perfect setting, but he was created as our first parent, Adam, and that you and I are sons and daughters of Adam. But God, who has an absolute holy nature and that he's pure, God's not a human. We all think, you know, so many times you think that God is just this super old, really smart human. God is spirit. He's not human. That's why the incarnation of Jesus is such a big deal, is because God came to earth as a human. He didn't come as an angel. He didn't come as an animal. You know, there's all this talk about nature and all this stuff. Oh my goodness. It just dawned on me this morning. Did you hear, did you hear Nancy Pelosi today? Yes. Nancy Pelosi talking about, we better get our act together, ladies and gentlemen. We better shape up now because we've offended Mother Earth. That's why things are so hot right now. And that's why there's so many electrical storms and flooding going on. And that's why there's so many droughts. We have offended Mother Earth. Man, I wish you would talk with that passion about Father God. <laughs> wow. Well, the truth of the matter is this. God is holy. God is pure. God is just. But he loves you. If, if, listen, if I could put it this way, God's big problem is he's got a big heart of love for you. Amen. You said, I didn't think God would have a problem. Well, I'm kind of being sarcastic about that. God doesn't have any problems. But here's the deal. His love for you is one where he could not outsource your salvation. There is Michael, the archangel, could not die on the cross for your sins. Why? Because you're not an angel. And he's not a human. God created you, and thus when Adam and Eve sinned, to redeem us back to himself, God became one of us. Absolutely amazing and awesome. And so church, mark it down. We see this in verse 15, that Jesus' gift resulted in life. Notice the two words, gift and life. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. In other words, the free gift that comes through Jesus Christ is nothing like the offense of sin that came through Adam. Not even close, friends. The comparison is for us to understand the opposites as we studied last time. So Adam worked, as it were, at his offense. Can you put that down in your note taking or your, your thought? Adam worked at his offense. When he sinned, he did something of his own volition. He had to do it. He did it, and frankly, he did it because he wanted to do it. The Bible teaches that Adam, in theology, he looked at God, so to speak, and shook his fist at God and said, I'm going to transgress against you, Adam. Wow. Now, Eve must have been really something. People will joke about this. I get it. No doubt, Eve must have been something amazing. But Adam is not saying, well, God, you know, I love you so much, but I, I love Eve, and, and she's so beautiful, and we got this relationship going, and I just don't have time for you right now, and 
so I'm going to go with her. That's, that's nice if you're writing a love novel, but that's not how it was. And you know the answer. You've been studying for a couple of weeks now. Eve sinned against God by crossing the line. And in some ways, we would say she made a big mistake. She definitely sinned. Adam then comes along and knows what she did. The example of what she did is in front of him. And Adam, in transgression, boldly resists God, boldly refuses God. And as that offense is so great that it plunged humanity into sin. So yesterday I'm holding Ed's hand in the hospital. And I, I think I leaned over to uh, Miss Gabby from the office. She was in the, in the hospital room. And I said, you know, isn't it awesome? As I hold his hand and his skin and his body and his age, a testimony to this fallen world. I said, Gabby, remember, the inside of Ed's not sick. The outward man's perishing. The Bible says the inward man's being renewed day by day. You think about that for a moment. What Adam did plunged us, and as big as that offense was, what Jesus Christ did for us by extending us this gift of salvation is far greater. So check this out. Adam worked at his offense, resulting in death and decay, right? Jesus' gift of life, he offered to us, resulting in life and eternity. In other words, whatever Adam did, it's not as powerful as what Jesus did. The bad that Adam did cannot trump the good that Jesus did. Whatever Adam did... What Jesus did to counter that and to overthrow what Adam did regarding all of us is greater. Can't even be compared. And think about the world and think about the condition of things and think about the atrocities of life and the pain of suffering and death and sorrows. Well, what you and I are going to inherit one day in a real tangible way, right now we've inherited by faith, but there's going to be a day when you and I will inherit in eternity all things that Christ has done for us, and it will make Adam's offense look like a speck, because God's grace so abounds. Verse 15 says, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the Son of, or by the one man or the Son of God, Jesus Christ abounded to many. This word simply means that If sin can be passed down through all the human race by Adam, the much more is a tremendous statement. Whatever that is, Jesus did what he did for us much, much more. And verse 15 tells us this word about grace, the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Grace. I love this. Grace. The grace of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you this question. Think for a moment. You don't have to answer out loud. Think. How gracious is Jesus Christ? And I have to be, I'm going to say it, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it within structure. How gracious is the Lord Jesus Christ? What do we know for sure? We know that when Jesus walked on the earth, think about this. When Jesus walked this earth, he was the physical manifestation of the will of God. That's why the Bible says that in John 1, in the beginning was the word, logos, And the word became flesh and tabernacled or lived among us. John 1.14 says, and that word uh, became flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, and the word, logos, became skin, humanity, flesh. Why? 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 Why did God do this? To speak to you and I that whatever Adam did, in other words, I have come, I have arrived to fulfill my word. My word is this. Jesus is going to live out all of the demands of the law and meet the standard and the perfection of the law. He had to do it as a man. Jesus is not some hybrid. Jesus is not some enlightened one. He's not a guru of ancient mysticism. He's not someone who achieved nirvana. 
He's not an exalted man. Listen, my friends, there's a very popular American cult that teaches that you can earn your deity. Watch out for that theology. Jesus earned nothing. If anything, Jesus in the great kenosis is the great laying aside. God came down to earth and he laid aside willingly powers that he had, listen, powers that he could pick up at any time. Jesus laid them down and lived a life in his human body and skin, just like you and I do. But listen, the amazing thing about Jesus, do you remember when Peter, God bless Peter, he's just so us, we just don't want to admit it. Do you remember when they came to arrest Jesus? And Peter did what every one of us would have done. Peter grabbed his knife, and the guy that went to arrest Jesus, Peter reached out and went to kill the guy and missed and cut his ear off. Do you remember that? Peter's a bad, bad aim. And the Bible says that Jesus stooped down, picked up the man's ear, and put it on his head. That's pretty awesome. What happened? Jesus was there in his, our human weakness, to be arrested. We can relate to that, especially the way the world's going today. The way that our government's going today, who knows? I, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be with you all. <laughs> but Jesus willingly offers him up, himself up to be arrested. Peter tries to cut off some guy's ear and does. Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on. What happened just there? Manifestation of his deity and of his manhood all there in that one moment. It's called kenosis. For the second, so to speak, I'm being arrested. I'm being arrested. Peter, P pause. <laughs> Peter, don't you know that I could call down legions of angels to help me now? Just put away your sword. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Absolutely remarkable. How gracious is Jesus? That when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he's very aware of his influence, listen, he was young, he was wealthy, and he had authority. But he knew something was lacking on the inside of his life, didn't he? Because he came and he said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's an interesting question from a young, powerful, rich kid. Now, number one, I know by listening to you, Jesus, and studying you, I'm lacking. There's something lacking in my life. I need more. So what do I need to do? He approached Jesus in the wrong way. He approached Jesus in his humanity this way. Jesus, as a human, can you give me some human advice? It's all wrapped up in one word. Can you just tell me what to do? God gives gifts. God doesn't tell you what to do. God gives gifts, and in this case, it's the gift of salvation. God doesn't tell you this is what you do to get salvation. You got to jump over that. You got to do the other thing. But Jesus, knowing that man's heart, what did Jesus say? Because Jesus says something to him to try to bring him to the point of discovering his offense, the, 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 the rich young ruler's offense. Jesus said, well, you know what the law says. Tell me about it. And the man answers all the questions right. And Jesus says something spectacular. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me, and, and you'll have eternal life. That's not true. What was Jesus telling him? Translation, you want to follow me? Here's your problem. You list, you list the law and all the things that you've achieved. And notice, Jesus didn't refute any of that man's morality. Are you, are you a moral person thinking you're you know, you're pretty good enough for heaven. Listen, Jesus took a guy who was moral and Jesus uh, listened to him and said, yep, yeah, right on, dude, you're right on. Well, here's the problem. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then, then, then you'll be saved. That's not, that's not how you get saved. So what was Jesus doing? Jesus was going for the throat. <laughs> and in this case, Jesus was going for the treasure. 
The man's possessions, instead of the man managing and being a good steward over his possessions, don't raise your hand, but has God given you stuff? Do you have something? Do you have $10 in your pocket? Do you have $10 million in your pocket? Do you know it's irrelevant to God? It's simply a tool. When you and I look at those as dollars, we get goofy. God says, they're just tools to be invested. So here's the thing. Does, does the $10 own you or do you own the $10? Does the $10 control you? And you can always tell when you're dealing with somebody who's got a problem with this because they'll hand you something and it's kind of like really hard to get it out of their hand. It's like... <laughs> I think, by the way, I'm seeing a flashback in my mind this weekend. I believe Christians should be big tippers. So how, how dare you say that? <laughs> Our son-in-law is from New Zealand, and he said in New Zealand they don't tip. And, he's, and he still struggles so much with that. It's so hard for him because in America, I don't know where this started. I think it was by some very clever person. But, you know, we pay all this money for this meal now. And, you know, you pay 20 bucks for a burger now with all that's going on. And then you're supposed to tip. And some countries, uh, they just won't do that. Because, uh, you know, what's with that? And in America, American, all, Americans all around the world are known to be tippers. Well, whatever. I think the Christian should be the best tipper. Amen. And by the way, when you tip big, you get to write on the receipt that you just signed. You can write anything you want when you tip big. You need Jesus Christ, Mike. <laughs> Read John 3, 16, Fred. Uh, and they have that. Listen, is, is tipping, because that's going to get their attention. You can even write, I gave you this tip. You didn't deserve all this. <laughs> but it's because Jesus forgave me of my sins. And if you turn to him, he'll forgive you too. So have a nice day. Right? Think about that for a moment. How gracious is Jesus Christ? A woman caught in the act of adultery is eventually brought to the point where she confesses, Lord, I have no one here to accuse me. She was brought to that place. She knew that she had sinned. And regarding the rich young ruler, when Jesus said, go sell all that you have, the Bible says he went away sad. Imagine, he walked away from Jesus. Wouldn't you love to see Jesus? I'd love to see Jesus. Well, yes, that's awesome. Just know this. What if he says something to you? What if he says to you, this one thing you lack, you go do this, and you know theologically that's not how you receive salvation, but you know instantly he touched a part of your heart that is an idol. You've got lights on it, you polish it, it's perfect, you know. Israel had their little bull Right? Remember when they rejected Yahweh from the mountain of Sinai? They rejected and they, they told Aaron here, you know, we want, a, we want a God to worship. I think it's just kind of funny that they wanted a God to worship. And so what came out of the fire? I think Aaron was lying. Aaron go, Mo, Moses go, what did you do, Aaron? I was only gone 40 days. What did you do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The people wanted to worship. They gave me their gold. I threw gold into the fire. That's what he said. I threw gold into the fire and a bull and a, 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 a idol, a cow came out. And they started bowing down to it. You believe that? I don't believe that. I think Moses said, you know what? You've always, you, mom and dad, you, you are always lying all the time. Aaron, what a storyteller that guy was. How gracious is God? He's so gracious. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 10, regarding Jesus, he was in the world and the word, world was made through him. The God of Genesis 1, 1, the Bible says right here is Jesus Christ. He's the, listen, he is the contractor. Wasn't he the carpenter? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the God of creation. So wait, I thought God created the heavens and the earth. He did. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 1, God created the heavens and the earth. 
If you keep reading the Bible, you'll find out in the book of Hebrews and in the book of Colossians and right here in John's Gospel, chapter 1, that Jesus is the contractor of the universe. The Bible says in Genesis that the Holy Spirit was brooding over the face of the waters at creation. But Jesus was the architect contractor. How gracious is God? And it says, and the world did not know him. He made the world, but the world didn't know him. He came to his own. This is a reference to the Jewish people. God chose to reveal himself to the Jewish nation. He could have picked any people group on the face of the earth. He picked the Jewish people. He came to his own, his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many, look at verse 12, everybody. But as many as receive him, to them gave uh, the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And that word name means his authority. Do you believe in the authority of Jesus Christ? I hope you do. Just know this, that he's a gracious, awesome God. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 tells us, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits. This is important because the word first fruits speaks to that claim we read a moment ago. That Adam, who, offend, who was the offender, came and introduced sin into our lives, of whom he is a type. What Adam brought as evil, Jesus, coming in human flesh, brought which is righteous. And in this, Jesus is the last Adam. There was the first Adam, and Jesus is the last Adam. What's amazing about this incredible fact is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. The first fruits means, listen, Jesus was the first one to be resurrected from the dead, never to die again. You, got, you guys all have that? Yeah, is it hot in here? Yes. It's hot in here. So, guys, that's a hint that it's hot in here. Somebody can turn on... There. So think about that. You say, wait a minute. Lazarus died, and he, wrote, he was, came back from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. Yes, he did. <laughs> Read the fine print. This is kind of a bummer. Jesus is the first fruits. He rose again from the dead, never to die again. That's what that word means. Lazarus, he died. He, Jesus raised him up from the dead. Lazarus, later on in life, died again. That kind of stinks, in my opinion. <laughs> Jesus had to be the prototype. He had to be the first fruit from the dead. Absolutely awesome. That's who he is. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, the Bible says, As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, a human. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit, watch this, is not first. This is kind of fun, watch this. The spirit doesn't come first. You and I know this. But the natural, that's what comes first. Afterward, then the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And that's every single one of us. And as is the heavenly man, speaking of Christ, so also are those who are heavenly. Notice the Bible refers to you being the believer, the one now that has been born again, who now lives a life that is alive and dead. We're dead to our old life, alive to the new life in Christ. The Bible calls us heavenly ones, really. It's kind of neat. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, <laughs> that's us today. Look at you. You're bearing the image of the man of dust. You look tired. It's because I'm made of dust. <laughs> you smell. That's because I'm made of dust. Uh, you know, you, you look older. I'm as old as dirt. <laughs> but that's not true of the man of the spirit. This outer man is perishing, as I mentioned earlier. To be a follower of Christ is to have the inward man being renewed and living on daily, every day, new, alive. In a way, there's something about us that we love 
We love new things, let's be honest. Why do you think new things sell? We like them. Why do you buy a new shirt or a new dress? Well, I need it. Yes, okay, that's fine. But why, why do you go through so much pain to pick it out? Right? Although as I get older, I find myself not caring what I'm wearing anymore. <laughs> Poor Lisa, she cares what I look like. I'm, I put her through grief because I don't care. She goes, did you see your hair? Did you look at your face? Did, what are you wearing? You, that, the pants, that doesn't work. But new, we like new. Women. Develop a perfume that smells like the inside of a new car. Did you get that? You'll have men just going. (laughs) Why do we love the smell of the inside of a new car? There's just something about it. You go to a new home or a model home or whatever it might be. There's this, this thing. I actually believe that that's not a sin. I think that is something where God is saying, just wait. Right now, according to the Bible, Jesus is preparing a place for us. It's so new, it's not even done yet. Wow. I love that. He creates within us a new life. And we're made of heaven now. This is one of the most powerful verses. Mark it down. I quoted it two weeks ago. It's good to have it again. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This is a great tattoo, if you're interested in that. <laughs> well, I noticed. I was watching worship, and all of our worship people, they got their tattoos, and <laughs> kind of feeling left out here. But <laughs> Beloved, now we are children of God. Raise, raise your hand if you are a believer or a follower in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's you right there. Beloved, now, now. These things have been written that you might know you have eternal life, says the Bible. Did you know that? It's not a guess. He said it. You believe it. You're following him. You know that you're a child of God. His Holy Spirit is stamped within your heart. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be or be like. It's talking about like, like how tall, how short, how doesn't, we don't know. But we know that when he is revealed, here's the best part, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You're going to see Jesus. And everyone who has this hope, I hope you do, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What does that mean? Follow Christ. Follow him. Just follow him. He'll take care of the rest. You follow him. What do I have to do? Nothing. Follow him. And that's what he does. So the beautiful thought is this. Jesus Christ broke the power of sin and death, but the converse is not true. Sin and death cannot break the power of Jesus Christ. You can say amen to that. Right? Think about that. Jesus broke the power of sin and death. That's a fact. But death cannot break the power of Jesus Christ. Do you see now the... Offense of Adam, that it can only go so far in being bad, but the goodness of God in Christ is infinitely good. The condemnation of Adam's sin is reversible. The condemnation of Adam's sin is reversible. The redemption of Jesus Christ is not reversible. So wait a minute, Pastor. I knew somebody who used to be a Christian, and now they're not. They were never a Christian. The Bible says they were pretenders. The effect of Adam and his act of sin is permanent unless, this is a diagnostic question, so to speak. The effect of Adam's act of sin is permanent unless nullified by Jesus Christ. Conversely, the effect of Jesus' act of redemption is permanent for all believers and cannot be reversed or nullified no matter what the unbeliever believes or says. I think that's fun. As a Christian, I have to calm myself down about that one because people, when they say, well, that's, uh, that's not true. Are you a believer in God? No. And you're telling me what? Jesus, Jesus didn't die for my sins. How do you know? You don't know nothing. 
I mean, honestly. So, I'm a Harvard PhD. Wait, good for you. But you don't know nothing about what Jesus Christ has done for you until you come to believe. When you come to believe, then your eyes open up. This is what's fun about us being believers is that God has opened up our eyes to truth. And look now, we're living in a world right now, if it wasn't so obvious, it, it would be scary, but because it is so obvious, it's now funny. When the, when the news or somebody reports this or that, and it's like, this is insane. Okay, wow, uh, I don't have my phone. It was just, uh, I, I took pictures of the headline. CNN, flash, push notification. It was Thursday, I believe. CNN, the CDC lifts all, lifts all COVID restrictions. Saying, wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. Take care of yourself. And your immune system works. <laughs> now, after thousands of people's lives have been destroyed, CDC, get the jobs back for those people who were fired. I had that headline news on my phone. I walked into the hospital last night. I said, and there's an officer there. And I said, hey, did you, did you hear what happened? And he goes, what happened? And I go, here, look. And he's reading, and he goes, whoa. And I go, when do you think this hospital is going to tell you that this happened? I said, this happened on Thursday. He goes, I didn't know this. And I go, I wonder how long, I wonder how much longer it's going to go on that you do not know this okay watch hang on now we're about ready to lose our YouTube feed right here <laughs> ready three two one here we go the reason why is because you can't control people if you let them find out the truth and now the CDC couldn't contain couldn't hold it down any longer what in the world's going on Listen, the believer sees things. I was on the news this morning. You guys stayed open in the, and never, you guys, the, the news reporter said, you guys turned out to be right. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, this church, and I said, you know what was fun? What was fun is what I didn't say. I didn't say, well, I have my doctorate in, <laughs> in bioengineering, and my conclusion is what I applied to the church, and we, are you kidding? I said, God's word says, don't forsake the assembling together. The church is to be together. We got to do that. <laughs> and while I'm saying that, you know what verse was in my head? God said, I will take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And it's like, okay, I'll be, I'll be a fool any day for Jesus. Okay, you think about that for a moment. God is so good. God is so good. We learn in verse 16 that Adam's effort failed, hallelujah, to condemn us. Adam's effort to disobey God failed to condemn us. The gift, listen, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. The awesome thing is that God knows what to do with condemnation. When man was condemned, God had an answer. Down deep inside, you know that that's something that you absolutely love, is that when you, in a relationship, experience forgiveness or restoration. And in Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness and restoration. What Adam did failed to condemn us. Why? Because God had a plan for redemption. Amen? Amen. What an awesome truth that is. Also, we learn in verse 16 that Jesus' gift resulted in restoration. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. This is an amazing theological statement with some, with some um, attitude to it. Look at that statement. But the free gift which came from many offenses. See, what is this? 
we wouldn't have known of the goodness of God without Adam's sin. You say, well, wait a minute, that could be argued all kinds of ways. Yeah, but you've got to argue it from what we know in reality. You don't know it's good news, the gospel, until you realize you got bad news going on around you. What Adam's sin did in, as being an offense, God's great gift resulted in the justification of any man or woman, boy or girl, who would receive his message of redemption. Church, this is an amazing statement. It's absolutely awesome. I want to read you out of the book of Revelation, chapter 5. We'll just do it together. I mean, I'll read it. We can, we can look at it together. The absolute justification that you and I receive from what Jesus did. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. John has seen heaven. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. John said, and I looked, and behold, and in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. That's Jesus in the book of Revelation. And how precious is that? Slain to bring us restoration. And thirdly, church, look at verse 17. We'll go through this quickly. Is the fact that we're rescued by one man's sacrifice. Rescued by Jesus' wealth. Can you mark that? His wealth. How were we rescued? We're rescued by his wealth. You see, we have to always by his blood. Yes to this. I'm not talking about physical wealth. That's ridiculous. I'm talking about who he is. For if by the one man's offense death reigned, if by Adam's offense death reigned through the one much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, that is Jesus Christ. The fact that, the, that God himself extended to us uh, what he owns. He owns life, agreed? He owns life. Only he can give it because he owns it. You and I cannot give life. I mean, in a, in a, in a micro sense, right? Think about it. Uh, a, 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 a mother gives life. I mean, technically, the dad, right, creates the motion of life. The mother is the host of that miracle, resulting in new life. That is like a, a snippet. It's like a snapshot for us to understand something. That God, who is the giver of life himself, is the only one who can give away what he has. You cannot give anything away that you don't have. You can't do it. You can only give away what you have. But when it comes to, listen, the salvation of our souls, what do you have? Call up Bill Gates. Call up Elon Musk. Call up Jeff Bezos. They got nothing. Man, I'm feeling kind of sick. I think I might be dying soon, and I'm a sinner. Bezos, can you give me a spare billion? <laughs> and with all the money in your hospital room, think of that. Think of the amazing. It's so amazing to me. You can have a room, a warehouse, packed with dollar bills, billions, and you're sick in the middle of that room. And you're going to meet your maker any moment. What power do you have? Zero. What wealth do you have? Now Jesus introduced to us treasures. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So what are we talking about? What, what, where do I get the, what's the exchange? And what's the exchange rate? The exchange rate is everything. 
You come to him. Listen, you don't halfway come to him. You come to him. And you say, God, I'm listening to this message right now. It makes a lot of sense. Sounds like to me you did all the, all the work and you're just inviting me to come and understand that I'm a sinner, a son of Adam, and I need your salvation. And so I come to you and I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to justify me, God, to give me your justification, to give me the wealth of your salvation. And all of a sudden, I'm sorry, I don't care. I don't care how much money you have. There's a lot of people sitting around here right now that are born again, going to heaven, and they're way richer than you are if you're not. You came, you came here into this place, well, I'll go see what's going on over there. Not that I need anything. Just know this. If you're not born again and the people around you are, we're the ones that are rich. I told you before, years ago, there was a guy buried in L.A. in his Ferrari. Now you think about that for a moment. Ferraris are great cars as long as you're alive to drive it, I guess, right? <laughs> did somebody, like, did somebody, like, get a memo? It's the, the, the guy was buried in a Ferrari. What is he going to do with that thing? <laughs> well, he can say that he was buried in a Ferrari. He can't say nothing! <laughs> you dig up that big plot, I think there were seven plots he had to buy. You dig up seven plots, and what do you have? You not only have a skeleton behind the wheel of a Ferrari, you can't even tell if it's a Ferrari anymore. Even the Ferrari died. It's all rusted out. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Might I remind you this is the God of the Bible? I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's pretty good stuff. That's precious. And then finally with this, verses 18 to 21, I told you, I mean, I'm prophesying, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We got eight minutes left. But here we are at the end. I'm sure I can mess this up somehow. The fact is that we are divided. Listen, we're divided by life and death. And it says here in this verse 18, it says, therefore, you ought to circle that word again. It's the second time in the structure of the argument where therefore appears. It's the summation of it all. By the death of one, my friend, we are convicted. Agreed? Adam died. That means you and I were doomed to die. Why? Because we took on Adam completely. And the scripture says that through one man's offense, judgment came upon men, resulting in condemnation. Listen, I, don't, I may not know all of you. Maybe you're new here today, but I can tell you this. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, I love you because I understand that you are a soul and a spirit and that Jesus loves you and he died for you. So in that way, I love you. And you say, how can you love somebody? And I understand before I was a Christian, people would say, I love you. I said, like, I love you. I'm thinking, what are these Christians talking about? You don't even know me. <laughs> it takes a Christian to understand that you can love not only a stranger, you can bump, up, bump into somebody for five seconds, and they're valuable to you because they're valuable to the God you love. Yeah. You say, you don't know me. And many times I tell people, many times I've told you, if you've said, but you, know, you don't know me. And I'll say to you, and I, I don't want to know you. Pastor, I want to tell you my past. Really? <laughs> Why tell me when he's forgotten? Right? I want to know you in Jesus now. I, just, I want to know you from this day forward. And so Christians love the souls of even their enemies. How can that be true? It is true. I can't explain it. I can just tell you how it works, but I can't explain it. God says, love your enemies, just like I do. And I say, I can't do that. And God says, good answer. I'll do it through you. Just get out of the way. Be dead to Jack. Be alive to me. 
and you'll see what life's about. Are you, listen, are you married to an absolute pain? Pest? Did you say pest? Pest, pain, trouble? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. I'm, I'm pretty happy to, to, to hear this. A, a, a young man probably three or four weeks ago came up to me and he says, do you remember me? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't. He said, about two years ago you came, or I came to you and my marriage has fallen apart and you told me to stop goofing off and be the most godly man that is possible and to ask God for his strength to be that most godly man. And he said, I did that. And you told me, Pastor Jack, to be the most godly man because that's what God wants me to be if my wife leaves me or not. Is that not true? And he said, listen. He said, my wife left me. And she left and she's gone. She married somebody else. He said, I got to tell you, these last two years have been absolutely awesome. (laughs) No, no, don't. That's terrible. That was not me. That was them over there, right there. You didn't let me finish. (laughs) He said, my life has been awesome these last two years because I have been married to Jesus Christ. So there. And secondly, we see that the one life, by one life, We are cleared. Look at verses 18 and 19. Even so through one man's righteousness. This is Jesus. His righteous act. The free gift came to all men. Resulting in justification of life. Verse 19 says. For as by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. We all know that. We all can say. Yep. Can you say the next one? So also by one man's obedience. Many will be made righteous. Can you say that? And then we end. Verse 20 to 21, we live because he lives. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, the law magnifies the sin for a good reason. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, well, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life. Friends. Sin's bad, sin's ugly, and the ramifications of it, every single one of us, including you who are here right now, the atheist, we all agree, it's terrible. The ramifications of sin, deadly. But the righteousness of Jesus Christ is greater. If today you would admit to God God, I've, I've actually had a hard time with you because I just thought getting near you was absolutely impossible. And am I hearing today, God, that by your obedience at the cross, my life can be declared righteous by what you did for me? Are you saying, God, that I can restart my life, get a new life? Isn't it amazing that as believers, we can get anything and everything new if we want it bad enough. But when he offers new life, it's not you getting it by how bad you want it. It's you getting new life for the asking. Wherever you go in this world, if you want something new, you got to buy it. In some way, shape, or form, you got to give to get it. Not with God. You want, to, you want to receive a new life? You can only accept it one way. It's a gift. If somebody says to you, how much did you pay for that gift? That's a flawed argument. Are you hearing me? Yes. Father, thank you. For Jesus, thank you for the gift. Oh. I'm assuming, Lord, to some degree anyway, we're healthy, we're here. We, can't, we came here under our own power. 
We'll live under our own power. And there's a good chance that the truth of this message won't have the grip that it could have if we had a palpitation in our chest or if we'd received news about our liver or that aneurysm. And then all of a sudden, eternal things become extremely relevant in the now. And God, I pray right now for all of us, both here in attendance and those abroad, that, Father, that we would stop right now and say, Lord, I am asking you to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and rose again from the dead. Just exactly as the Bible says, I choose today to believe And to move now away from the old Adam that has ruled in my life, my old life, I want to be dead to. And I choose today to be alive to the life of Jesus, to experience him in my life. I believe he died and rose again from the grave, and I now surrender to him. And we would say that in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that that would be something that is being heard and responded to around the globe before your coming. May our hearts and lives get right with you. God.